Why do so many of the indigenous cultures of the colder regions of North America seem to share the same legend? A legend that tells of a monster that lurks in the forests, bringing cold and death to any that meet it. This creature is an omen of famine, a territorial beast that preys on human beings. Some cultures describe it as an unholy abomination, a spirit of winter and a warning against the dangers of selfishness, one that is created whenever a person resorts to cannibalism in order to survive. It will gladly devour any man, woman, or child that wanders into its territory, holding a horrifying and insatiable hunger for human flesh. So how did so many cultures end up with the same story? Could it be because it's real? Depictions of the beast vary, but it is most commonly recognized by its tall skeletal form, like a body exhumed from the grave, even carrying the stench of death and decay with it. Anyone who encounters one risks being eaten or transformed into a creature just like it. The monster's name means an evil spirit that devours mankind, though to even say the name is taboo, as it's believed to give power to the beast. Of course, these are all just legends, right? Stories to warn against the dangers of greed and selfishness, but otherwise nothing to fear. There's no proof that such a beast could actually be roaming the frozen wastes. Many at the SCP Foundation felt the same way, until they heard about SCP-323, hmm. the Wendigo's skull. Kept under lock and key by the Foundation with around-the-clock surveillance, SCP-323 is an anomalous object with ties to the various Wendigo legends. As the object's moniker suggests, SCP-323 is a skull. Not a human skull, mind you. It more closely resembles a cervid skull. Cervids are a family of mammals that include most varieties of deer, elk, and other similar animals, and this particular cervid skull sports a tall pair of antlers. SCP-323 is definitely not a fresh skull either. It shows signs of weathering and a few scars across the surface, looking as if the bone has been bleached and eroded through exposure to the elements. The skull is also missing its lower jaw, and has a sizable hole on the rear underside that may have been carved using stone tools. SCP-323 is kept restrained inside an armored container within a concrete containment cell, and personnel are only ever allowed near it to check the restraints for signs of damage. Additionally, any Foundation staff that enter SCP-323 cell must be accompanied by an armed security officer, and in the event of a containment breach, the entire site is to be evacuated. Seems like a lot of precautions and safety measures for an old piece of bone. Surely a harmless deer skull could never be that dangerous, right? <gasps> Wrong. You might be forgiven for thinking that a skull can't possibly cause harm. After all, SCP-323 is just a skull, then whatever animal it belonged to is dead. But this skull is far more than it appears to be. Through extensive testing, the SCP Foundation's researchers have learned that the skull isn't dead. No, this skull is awake and aware. It can see, hear, and has a sense of touch, and it can and will react to various stimuli. However, this does not necessarily mean that SCP-323 is alive or even sentient, but it definitely appears to have some level of sapience. It will target certain members of personnel that get too close and has attempted multiple times to breach containment. It also reacts violently to anyone speaking English or French near it the only two languages prohibited inside SCP-323's cell. So while the skull is not technically alive, it is definitely aware. Still, why the need for so many protocols to keep it contained? It's not as if a skull can just walk off on its own. Of course not. But SCP-323 can move, at least to a certain degree, often in a reactionary manner. SCP-323 will vibrate or move on its own, for example, turning to watch as personnel enter its containment cell. In most cases, these movements are tiny and insignificant, but other times the skull lunges, launching itself at Foundation personnel as it desperately tries to get free. Now you know why it's kept restrained. So, we have an antlered cervid skull that can move and has a low level of awareness. On their own, these would be more than enough to warrant the Foundation's interest, but the anomalous properties of SCP-323 don't stop there. The skull has an inherent ability to influence the minds of those around it, 
Anyone spending an hour within a 15-meter radius of SCP-323 is likely to experience the effects of this influential power. This will often result in them exhibiting uncharacteristic behaviors, thoughts, and urges, including cannibalistic tendencies and outbursts of random violence. Almost three-quarters of people that suffer the influence of SCP-323 will feel an overwhelming compulsion to take the Wendigo skull and fit their heads into the chiseled hole on the rear underside. If someone attempting this finds that their head is too big to fit inside the hollow skull, there have been cases of individuals trying to bludgeon their heads on any hard surface they can find nearby in an attempt to get their head down to a more manageable size. This will continue until one of three outcomes occurs. One, the person manages to fit their head into the skull. Two, they cause themselves so much cranial damage that they are rendered unconscious. Or three, they end up killing themselves through repeated violent head trauma. Of course, if a person actually manages to fit their head inside SCP-323, then that is a different story entirely. In these instances, the individual becomes classified as an instance of SCP-323-1. Within 10 minutes of wearing the skull, this person will suffer dramatic changes to their body. Any and all body fat will be rapidly shed as their hair also begins to fall out, leaving them looking starved and almost skeletal in appearance. Their distal phalanges, those are the bones at the tip of the fingers, will elongate and rupture the skin as they become bony, claw-like appendages. The subject will also find that their teeth have grown abnormally long and sharp, while their limbs will blacken as if they were suffering frostbite symptoms. Along with their external transformations, SCP-323-1 will also get increased strength and heightened resistance to pain. They aren't invulnerable, though, and can still sustain damage and injuries. SCP-323 will also have a dramatic change happen to their metabolism which will occur a few minutes into the physical transformation. The subject will now need an almost constant intake of calories, which, if they don't receive, will cause them to starve almost instantly. With the transformation process complete, the new instance of SCP-323-1 has finally become the Wendigo, a terrifying monster with one goal to feed. The SCP-323 instance will seek out any human beings it can find so that it can feed upon their flesh. Those who have witnessed the 323 instance in the midst of a feeding frenzy have described the way it violently slaughtered any person it could find, leaving only a mess of blood as it devoured them their screams mixed in with the sounds of bones crunching. In the times that the creature cannot find a human to nourish its monstrous appetite, it will try to keep itself alive any way it can. Sometimes it will slow down its movement to try and conserve energy. Other times it will ration whatever food is available to it saving some of its last meal for a leftover snack. And on occasion, the monster will engage in auto-cannibalism, a form of cannibalism that involves eating parts of itself. Humans certainly seem to be its preferred food source, though. Even when other sources of meat would be easier to acquire, SCP-323-1 will zero in on human beings and will do anything it can to make a person its next meal. When chasing down its prey, human or otherwise, SCP-323-1 has been observed uttering phrases either spoken in the primary language of whoever was transformed by the skull, or in the Severn, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Cree languages. These are all native languages of the numerous indigenous creatures that shared legends of the Wendigo. Where do the phrases come from, though? Are they another side effect of SCP-323's influence? Or do they originate from the skull itself? The Foundation's researchers are still trying to figure that out, and at the moment, they have no clues as to where they come from. In one containment breach in 2006, during which an instance of SCP-323-1 was able to kill and devour 12 members of Foundation personnel, on-site surveillance recorded audio of the creature speaking. It rasped, while dragging a body behind it. After this, the sound of a wet cracking noise was recorded, possibly one of the victim's bones being broken by SCP-323-1 so it could get to the marrow inside. 
The 323-1 instance does at times seem to try and resist the influence of the Wendigo skull. Additional recordings capture the creature saying, The creature then said, followed by noises of it eating the body. It seems that even the Wendigo has its own internal struggles, perhaps showing that there is still something left of the human who put on the skull, and that deep down they are fighting against their cannibalistic impulses. But where exactly did the Foundation find SCP-323? And is it really the skull of an actual Wendigo? the famous creature from North American legend. In 1997, the SCP Foundation sent a detachment to Bitterin Lake in Saskatchewan, Canada. There had been reports of a local community murdering individuals and leaving their bodies in the forest to appease a dangerous creature residing nearby. This creature, as it was later discovered, was an instance of SCP-323-1. Someone had found the skull and succumbed to its influence placing it on their head and turning into a monster. Ever since, the locals had been killing people and offering up their dead bodies as sustenance, fearful of what would happen if they didn't, after being brought up with legends of the Wendigo. SCP Foundation agents were able to capture the beast, however it died of starvation while being transported back to containment. They also covered up the recent deaths in the area by giving the local residents amnestics and creating a cover story about an unidentified serial killer. Killer. Prior to this, James Namagoose, a local man who was involved in the murders, was brought in for questioning. He remained oddly calm when interviewed, but admitted he had helped move the bodies that were being offered up as food for SCP-323-1, or as he called it, the Wendigo. According to James, a local story among the Cree people told of men who had once tried to control a Wendigo, and perhaps even tame it through offerings of food. Whether or not James and his fellow locals had the same intention, their primary concern was keeping themselves safe. He described first encountering the creature, a warped man walking out of the woods, killed our friends right in front of us. Sometimes it would stare more than it would make to kill, try to talk to you. It whispered at me, Pemisto, come and eat. It made me cold in my bones. As the interview continued, James claimed that he felt like he understood this warped man. He described feeling like the Wendigo was encouraging him to kill, that the creature would help him pass when his own time came. James told the Foundation doctor questioning him that he had heard the creature in his mind, and he felt it watching him almost constantly. Mr. Namagu stated that he hoped in killing people as offerings to the Wendigo, that his own family would be spared. Like the other locals, James Namagus was given amnestics to forget all about the creature and the murders he'd played a part in committing. So far, none of the Foundation's staff had experienced any similar behavioral effects to those James described. Those who work closely with SCP-323 or have witnessed an instance of SCP-323-1 have felt the creature communicating with them, or urging them to kill on its behalf. Ultimately, who is to say if SCP-323 is the skull of a Wendigo like those from Legend? It certainly seems like it is, but with no way to tell exactly how old the skull is, perhaps it's actually the reverse, and it was the Wendigo legend that spawned from instances of SCP-323-1 that were first encountered by indigenous North American cultures hundreds of years ago. One thing is for certain, if you ever come across a skull with tall antlers, you should try to resist putting it on. Otherwise, you might not be feeling like yourself for much longer. Now go check out SCP-3166 Monster Garfield Attacks Gorefield and SCP-2317 The Devourer of Worlds A Door to Another World for more monstrous SCPs that'll haunt your dreams.